good morning everyone so we are recording now um madhav can you hear me okay i think i saw you in the call all right so let's just start from where we stopped yesterday so we looked at the algorithm and we didn't write down a rigorous you know pseudo code or whatever for the algorithm but we sort of got the essence of what we have to do in order to ensure both the conditions shantanu just pointed that i made a mistake uh, i meant to say condition 1 is ensured by putting directions on the edges right so our base algorithm in some sense was based on condition 2 but then we realized that we could end up in a situation where the tight graph has shortest st path but it also has st paths that are not shortest so we need to make sure that we choose a path in the tight graph which will actually be a shortest st path in the original graph right? and the way we solve that issue is we put directions on the edges and we consider the directed tight graph instead of just an undirected tight graph, right okay great and that basically ensures condition 1 of complementary slack and therefore it has to be an optimal solution therefore it has to be a short path so this is where we completed yesterday and now i want to uh, formalize um, matters right so the main goal today is to put it in a more formal setting uh now for the sake of completeness uh we should also talk a little bit about digraphs right so we won't go into extensive uh, discussion but just the basics what is a digraph and what are the key points that we need for this course in particular for this algorithm i'm not even sure if we will see digraphs beyond this algorithm okay so let me give an example so just talk about digraphs for a bit so here is one example v0 v1 v2 v3 and i'm going to put directions on some of these and i'm going to put one more arc going the other direction okay and let me give names to these arcs this is a0 a1 a2 a3 and a all right so what we have in a digraph is a similar to a graph so we have a set of vertices let's call it h uh, v comma a and a is going to be a set of arc also known as directed edges I'll generally use arcs, and each arc is similar to an edge, except that instead of being an unordered pair, it is an ordered pair of vertices. Are you comfortable there, Ravi, or do you want to switch? Okay, let me see. Okay, so let me try. Yeah, is that better? Okay, great. Each arc is an ordered pair of vertices. Okay. So the main difference is it is ordered, as opposed to regular graphs where we have unordered pairs. and just a bit more of terminology i'm not even sure if we will need all of it but it's just the basic stuff in direct graph theory so so for example if you look at our arc a2 a2 is going from v0 to v2 so the order is v0 to v2 so what you do is you put the tail first so this vertex is called the tail and this vertex here is called the head of the arc This is our arc A two, 
and A3, notice that it's the same two vertices, but the order is changed. All right. So I think that's about all we need for the terminology. Okay. And uh, notice that we are considering what are often known as simple digraphs. So what does a simple digraph mean? For any two vertices, U and V, they will be joined by zero, one, or two arcs. And if it is two arcs, they will be they have to be in the opposite directions. Right. So any two vertices are joined by zero, one, and if two, uh, then one of them is UV and other is UV. And the point is that we only need uh, simple digraphs. Uh, right, right, okay, yes. Um, U is not equal to V. So yeah, ordered pair of vertices and they should be distinct. So, yeah. And if, uh, yeah, I'll just say there are no self loops. That's how they do. And no loops like this. Okay. So that is also implicit. So we will only care about simple digraphs because in our algorithm, we will just get a simple digraph. Let's not worry about the other ones. Uh, finally, we need to know what our directed path is. Well, it is exactly what you think it is. So our die path, also known as a directed path, So let's say an ST die path, right? So you start at a certain vertex S and you end at a certain vertex T and all the arcs should be going from S away from S, right? So this is S and T. So all the arcs will be pointing away from S and therefore towards T. So in this example, let's see, uh, V0, V1, V2, V3. Is that a dipath or is it not a dipath? V0, V1 is going in one direction and V1, V2 and V2, V3 are going in the other direction. So this in particular is not an S, not a dipath. However, if you look at V0, V2, V3, that could be a die path depending on which arc you are referring to, right? So if you look at V0, V2, you have an arc going from V0 to V2, and you have one arc going from V2 to V3. So V0, V2 is the arc um, A2, and V2, V3, there is only one arc joining them, which is A2. And so this is a die path. So while you can think of it as a sequence of vertices, you might as well think of it as a set of arcs. Right? But one is more compact to write than the other. All right, so, and the main point is that finding a path or a die path in a graph or a digraph is easy, right? We know that, this is basic. So note that, finding a path or a die path Or a diagram. Just do that for the question. Okay. So we don't care about this part. This part is a prerequisite for the course. Are there any questions or concerns at this point? All good? Okay. Okay, so in that case, we have all the digraph terminology that we need. Now let's sit down and formalize the algorithm that we discussed yesterday.
Okay, so let's start a new page. All right, so. Okay, so let's try to get the meat of the algorithm first. What is the key step? What, what are we doing at any step of the algorithm? Right? And then we will worry about details like initialization and termination. Those are just minor things. So my first question to you is, at any step in the algorithm, what are the main things we have? Um, the set R, the type digraph H, and one more thing, very important. Right, the slacks are computed using the dual feasible solution, which is why we call this a primal dual algorithm, right? So at any step in the algorithm, we have these three key ingredients. So note that at any step, we have the following three things. The first point is the Y bar, which is the dual feasible solution. Using the dual feasible solution, you can compute your graph H, the tight a tight digraph H. Right. And finally, if you have the graph digraph H, then you can also figure out which vertices are reachable from the source S in that digraph. And that is going to be our set R. Um, a set R, which is a subset of the vertex set of the graph uh, containing the source in particular. Right? These are the three key things that we have at any step. Okay, let us also make it complete by noting what all are we given. We are given a graph G with two distinct vertices. Uh, and we have a cost function going from the edges of the graph and each edge gets a non-negative real number. All right. <clears throat> so now I want to think about what is happening at any step. So let's just focus on, let me just call it the main step. <clears throat> so what exactly are we doing at any step? So let's say you have the Y bar, you have the tight tie graph, and you have the set R. How shall we proceed now? Uh, right, so let's say we are in the loop. Let's worry about what the loop conditions are later. Let us look at the loop um, content. So what are we doing in this loop that you are referring to? Right, so let's compute the smallest flag. Let's call it beta. So let beta be the minimum of the slack. Oh, did we start recording? Yeah, we did, right? Uh, I think we did. Yeah, yeah, we are recording. Good. Um, yeah. Okay, so we are computing the minimum of the slack of all the edges. And which are the edges we are looking at? Edges in the cut R. So we are looking at edges in partial of So let's say this value is a certain quantity beta. So now what should we do? So, okay, go ahead. Uh, right, we will set Y bar. So let me just write it here. Y bar of partial of R, we will set it to beta. But uh, before I do this, is there something else I should be doing? Uh, right. Which will happen, so the slack will reduce when you change the dual, right? But before we 
change the dual feasible solution, we want to make sure that we add those edges to the tight graph. Right? So because right now we haven't changed R yet, and we want to look at the current slacks, not the slacks after changing the Y bar, right? So before we change the Y bar, we want to make sure that we look at the edges um, that are in this cut and we add them to the directed graph. So in particular, let us have a loop for each edge E, which is in this cut. And what else should the edge satisfy? Right, so the slack of this edge should be, should be equal to beta, right? We just want to look at those edges which are actually going to become tight, right? And the slack, uh, so let me say rather than and, let me say such that, such that the slack of this edge is the minimum, which we have already computed beta. Uh, we want to add this arc. We want to add an arc to the directed graph, right? So it is an edge in the cut, we know that by the way this algorithm works, one of the, and by the definition of a cut, one of the ends will be in R and the other end will be in R complement, right? By the definition of cut. Uh, so let me actually say, rather than E, let me say UV. And let me change this to UV. Is this easier? Uh, so adjust notation. So that U is in R and V is in the complement of R, right? We know one is going to be in R, one the other is in R. And we are going to add the arc UV to the arc set of our directed graph H, which is our di uh, tight digraph. Okay, so you've added all the tight all the arcs that are going to now become tight once we change the Y bar, right? Uh, so we have already added them and now we are uh, changing the dual variable. And, and now what should we do? All right, add V to R, I can do that at every step or I can just uh, focus on the main point. Of, so there's, there's an implementation point. What I will do instead is just write down the definition of R. Right? But when you actually implement it, you want to improve the running time. You want to make it more, uh, you want to make it more efficient. So then you figure out the details, how to do that, right? So I'll just write down the definition, which I think is a bit more fundamental in the grand scheme of things. So R is just the set of vertices reachable from the source in the digraph H. And we say reachable, we mean by means of type R, right? So reachability here is in the directed sense, right? But you are right. In reality, you shouldn't compute this every time. You should just, whenever you add the arc, you add the vertex V to the set R, right? Uh, but that, as I said, is just an implementation V. Okay? So this is how we are uh, updating everything. So notice that we have a, this part here is updating the directed graph H by adding R. This is your dual update. Uh, maybe I'll call it a DFS update. Right? So here is your dual feasible solution update. And here is your R update. Right? So we have updated everything. And that means that we will be able to use all this information in the next step according. So this is the main step of our algorithm. Right? And of course, as you mentioned, this is actually a loop. And what is the terminating condition for this loop? T is an R, right? So let's call it a while loop. While T is not in R, keep doing the following. Okay, so now we need to worry about the 
other details of this algorithm, right? So, okay, so the termination is easy, right? Let's figure out the termination. First. Supposing you reach the point, you exit this loop and your T is already in R. Okay, so now what should I do? Let me just call this termination. Right, find an ST die path in H and return that die path, right? Exactly. So let's say Q is an ST die path in H. We know it will exist because the loop has existed. So T is in the set R and therefore there should be an ST die path. And we return this path. Uh, except that we are going to re return the underlying undirected path. That's a minor detail. Return Q, basically forgetting the direction. And a good algorithm does not just return a shortest path. It also returns one more thing. But just the Y bar, right? It is a certificate of optimality. So. Why should a person believe that the algorithm is correct? Well, you give them a dual feasible solution. Now they cannot argue, right? So, so return not just Q, but also the dual feasible solution, right? So just for the sake of completeness, this is going to be our, this is actually going to be our shortest ST path, which you have to prove in the correctness. And in particular, it is a optimal solution uh, let me just call it a primal. Right. Is in particular a primal feasible solution that is also optimal. Right. And Y bar is going to be our certificate of optimality in this particular sense that it certifies that the short path is indeed the shortest path. And in particular, it is a dual feasible solution that is optimal. Okay, so that is easy termination. So now let's go to the boring part of the algorithm, generally the initialization, right? So at least I find it the most boring part. So how do we initialize the algorithm? We start with y bar zero. Okay, that is easy. So let's set y bar to zero, the zero vector. Uh, sorry. Okay, so let me put vertices of h first and let's talk about the arcs a bit. So the vertex set of h is exactly the vertex set of g, right? We don't want to worry about the vertices. Okay. Mm, that is the point I want to discuss now finally. Should there be no edges or should we add some edges? Remember, our costs are non negative. Ah. So, if there are zero cost edges, something that we did not care about until now because it is a technicality, what should we do with zero cost edges? Any ideas? But they could be used in a shortest path now, or a shortest ST path. So, we. Yeah, we can add. Right, so how should we add them? That is my question. We should add them. How should we add them? Because they are already tied. Do you agree? The edges with cost zero are already tied at this point. So we probably should add them right now, right? Because H is always our tight graph. So why should we wait until the algorithm actually starts? Right? So if you want to maintain consistency of our definition, we might as well start with some edges in the graph, which correspond to the arcs in the digraph, which correspond to edges in our graph. So what should we do for an edge UV of cost zero? How shall we deal with it? Add both directions. Add both directions. No, no the edges are undirected, right? Okay. The edges are undirected. So if there is an edge UV, should we add it from U to V or V to U? Because in a shortest die path or in a shortest ST path, it could be used in either direction, right? Okay, so we'll just add all of these arcs 
in both directions right so that is why we need so that is that is the only case in our directed graph where both kinds of edges will exist if you think about the algorithm you will never get both the arc uv and vu except for this particular situation right <clears throat> so um, right so let's do that so this is our step 1 in initialization step 2 step 3 in the initialization is for each edge of the graph sorry let me call it uv for each uv in our graph g So for each UV in our graph G, uh, such that the cost of this edge is equal to zero, let us add both the arcs U to V and V to U to the arc set of our digraph H. Okay, and what is the last thing we should do now? R is again this reachable, right? Because there could be zero edge arcs at the vertex S. So we should already throw them into our R, right? So R is as before, as in the loop itself. R is the set of vertices reachable from the source vertex in the digraph H. Once again, by means of dipath. Okay, so we have initialized the dual feasible solution, we have initialized the graph H, and we have also initialized the set R. Right? That's it. That's what I'll go. Okay. Right. Uh, you can definitely do this through max room in cut. If I'm not mistaken, you should be able to do that. Right. Yeah. So I don't know if you can do it by min maximum min cut, but anyways, the, the similarities are definitely there because after all, maximum min cut is uh, yeah. Right. Right. No, there are lots of similarities for sure. In general, if you look at these combinatorial optimization algorithms, you will see a lot of similarities because the underlying principles are mostly the same. Right? The driving factors behind all of these algorithms are actually the same. In fact, one of the reasons I did it this way, I hope that the way we have done this, you can actually do the bipartite perfect matching one on your own. It will be time consuming if you're doing it for the first time, but I'm hoping that you will be doing it in the lectures anyway, but if you want to try, you can try getting the bipartite uh, perfect matching minimum cost algorithm uh, on your own. Just look at, write down the primal dual conditions and see if you can yourself figure out how this algorithm should work. The, the complementary slackness conditions will essentially be driving your algorithm. That's actually the next thing we are going to cover. Okay, good. Um, all right, so what else do I want to say here? Um, yeah, so that's the algorithm. Okay, so let me just make a note here. So I don't want to write down the proof of correctness and running time and all these things for this particular algorithm. We might do it for matchings in the lectures. This one I'm going to probably perhaps break it into parts or not break it into parts and put it on assignment time. Okay, so I have figured it out. So I'll just say that the complete proof of correctness plus running time 
will be on assignment five. Okay, uh, we have essentially discussed the important parts through our discussion yesterday and somewhat today. Okay? So hopefully the discussion will already tell you how you proceed to prove the correct. That is essentially formalizing everything that we have discussed. Right. Um, right. So, uh, why exactly? That's right. But we have, um, but we have, we don't need to keep track of all the whys, right? So, um, more than assumptions, I would just say tricks. We'll have to use some tricks, right? You don't need to store the y bars that are zero. We'll have to write the exact algorithm. Right, right, right. So, you will have to, yeah, that's right. So you'll have to, uh, yeah, optimize it further, <laughs> right? So I'll say, okay, uh, for the running time, you also have to optimize it further, right? In particular, you don't want to keep, keep track of all the Y's because there is exponentially many ST cuts, but we only need certain types of Y's in this graph, right? So for all the Y's that we don't keep track of, they are zero. We just need to keep track of those Y's which are greater than zero. And those will not be exponential. So those are the kind of details you will have to uh, take into account in the assignment. Right? And the other kind of detail, for example, when we discussed this, right? We talked about R being the set of vertices reachable. You don't need to run the whole dipath uh, algorithm again. You just need to make some modification. Right. So in the initialization step also, you can make those changes incrementally, right? Because you are adding a bunch of arcs and uh, those arcs might increase the size of R depending on how they are added. So probably, again, I don't think you will need those uh, tweaks for polynomial time because computing reachability is poly time already for a diagram, right? So computing the set of reachable vertices in a directed graph is poly time already. Also in the assignment, I won't ask you to optimize poly time because that is not the point of this course. Right? The point of this course is more to get the algorithm that is a polynomial time algorithm, whether it is n to the power six or n to the power three, I really don't care, right? Don't make it n to the power thousand. I think that should be avoided, right? So we are not going to try to get the polynomial smaller. We are just going to get some reasonable poly time algorithm. All right. Um, okay. So next uh, point I want to make is um, notice that we have also proved a theorem, right? We, um, you see, at the end of the algorithm, we are not only finding a shortest ST path; it is actually a primal feasible solution that is optimal, right? In particular, we had the ILP, the integer linear program. We had the LP relaxation. In theory, the optimal value of the LP relaxation could be lesser than the optimal value of the integer linear program, right? Because it is a minimization problem and you have thrown away some constraints. So the optimal value could go down in theory. But through this algorithm's correctness, which will be proving on assignment five, it follows that actually the optimal value does not go down because the shortest path is an optimal solution to the primal uh, LP. Okay. So that's uh, that follows from the correctness of this algorithm. So theorem 3.5 is the following, that the shortest path LP relaxation has an integral optimal solution in fact not only integral it is a zero one optimal solution right it is binary in fact a zero one optimal solution right 
and in particular the optimal value of the LP relaxation is equal to the optimal value of the ILP. Okay, so this just uh, follows from the correctness of our algorithm. All right. Okay, great. So I think that is all more or less I want to say today. I don't want to start a new topic. I'll just uh, say a few words about the new topic. All right, so what's next? Oh, maybe I should say one more thing. Um, right, so I think I already said it verbally. Let me just write it down. So what we have seen is that we have an algorithm for the shortest path problem. At every step in particular, we have a dual feasible solution, right? We don't have a primal feasible solution till the very end. We get it at the end. And it also happens to be optimal because of complementary slack, right? But what we have at every step is a dual feasible solution. And it is that dual feasible solution that is guiding us towards our primal optimal solution, which is the shortest path, SP path in this case, in particular, right? This kind of an algorithm is called a primal dual algorithm. Okay, so I'll just write down the main point. At each step, we have a dual feasible solution which guides us in some sense in reaching the shortest path, which is also going to be an optimal primal feasible solution. And such an algorithm is called a primal dual algorithm. Right, so it's a whole class of algorithms, just like you have the greedy algorithm, for example. Right? So all of these algorithms are based on this idea. And the next goal for our module, this module is uh, primal dual algorithm for the minimum cost perfect matching problem. Um, in perfect matching and in many other topics in graph theory, there is a stark distinction between the bipartite case and the non bipartite case. And perhaps it is most pronounced in matching theory among all different fields of graph theory. Um, so we will be first doing it for bipartite graphs, which is significantly easier than um, what happens in non bipartite graphs. Just to give you a sense, I've forgotten the years and the exact dates and everything. But if I'm not mistaken, the bipartite version will was already known to the Hungarians, some certain uh, people in the Hungarian mathematical community which is why it's also known as the Hungarian algorithm for minimum cost uh, bipartite perfect matching. And that was already, if I'm not mistaken, in uh, early 1900s. Um, I'll look at the exact years and tell you that next time. However, for the non-bipartite or the general case, it was only found by Jack Edmonds in 1965. There was almost around a 50 year gap between the two, maybe even more. Um, so there is a really the, uh, the non-triviality in the non-bipartite case is significant, which is another reason why we will first go through bipartite case. So some of you might have seen bipartite mix cost perfect matching in your previous courses, but some of you may not. So I think we should cover it because otherwise understanding the non-bipartite case is really like 
understanding why all those things are really necessary becomes much harder if you have not seen the bipartite case separately. So we will go through the bipartite case and then we'll go through non-bipartite. Another point is there is a difference between shortest path and the perfect matching case in the following sense. We observed that finding a path or a die path in a graph or a digraph is easy, right? This particular uh, problem will require us to find perfect matchings in the tight graph. There will again be a tight graph based on complementary slackness in the perfect matching uh, algorithm that we'll be seeing. And in that tight graph, we will have to find a perfect matching. So in particular, we will need to know how to find a perfect matching. So we will first go through that, how to find a perfect matching in a bipartite graph. Then we will do min cost perfect matching for bipartite graphs. Then we will go to how to find a perfect matching in general graphs, and then go to minimum cost perfect matching in general. Right, so we need four steps, right? So I'll just put down, we'll start with uh, finding perfect matching in bipartite graphs. Uh, min cost perfect matching bipartite version. Then we'll go to finding perfect matching in general graphs. And finally, we'll go to min cost perfect matching in general, that means non bipartite. All right. So you can expect this to take up around, I don't know, I haven't really taught this course before. Maybe around the next two weeks, we are going to just be doing perfect matching. Okay, so I'll say at least two weeks. Okay, which is why I made assignment for mostly about perfect matching. All right. Okay, so that's all for today. And are there any questions or concerns? Yes, 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 definitely. We are going to study that. So the the key idea is a theorem that you have already proved on assignment one, I believe. Burge's lemma. Or I don't know if I call it Burge's theorem. Right? So what it says, do you remember what it says? Yeah. A matching is maximum if and only if there is no augmenting path with respect to that matching, right? So what we'll actually do is we'll try to find a maximum matching in a bipartite graph, right? And if it is perfect, then that is your maximum matching. If it is not perfect, then the graph does not have a perfect match. Because if there is a perfect matching, it is a maximum matching. And all maximum matching will be perfect matching. Right? So we will actually, most likely, if I'm not mistaken, I still have to prepare tomorrow's lecture to be honest. Most likely we'll be looking at finding a maximum matching in bipartite graphs, which is, going to automatically solve finding perfect matches. Okay? And the key idea is, both for bipartite and for general graphs, the key idea is find an augmenting path. If you can find an augmenting path, then you can increase the size of your matching and you can keep proceeding. Or at some point you find a certificate that from which you can infer that there is no M augmenting path anymore. So your matching is maximum. So the key idea behind any ma maximum matching or perfect matching algorithm is Berger's lemma. Find augmenting path at each point. The only problem is finding augmenting path is much harder in non bipartite graphs than in bipartite graphs. That's, that's the key difference. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. No? Let me look at the people who are online. I tend to. Okay. Anyone who is in the call, any questions or concerns? Was any part in today's lecture that wasn't clear? Okay, I guess not. All right, so feel free to leave the meeting and we'll meet tomorrow at nine o'clock and we'll start uh, perfect matchings in bipartite graphs. Okay. Okay, so I'll stop recording now.